welcome everyone to an early morning, a relatively early morning focus session. Um, glad to see you all here. A lot more people came than I was expecting. Uh, so that's great. That's a good problem to have. Um, as you know, the focus for this year's focus is uh, rethinking humanity, what are people for? And I want to approach that question from or through the lens of beauty. How does beauty help us understand or think about what people are for generally? And particularly, how does beauty help us understand our own lives? How does it, think, how does it help us think more carefully about what we're for uh, and how we might better do what we're called to do? So the title of my talk is Through the Visible to the Divine, Beauty, Form, and the Human Person. Partway through the talk, I'll get to this image up here, um, this uh, Italian fresco. But if you get bored at any point throughout, just look at that. That will probably say much better what I want to say than what I'm So, um, all right. I want to speak simply today about beauty, which is kind of foolish because you can't speak simply about beauty. Beauty is complex, it's unique, it's a whole lot of things. Um, so what follows has two main objectives. First, to awaken us to the importance of beauty. To make us just a little more sensitive to its presence in our lives. Help us pay attention to it better. And second, to provide us with a few basic terms to talk about beauty. And hopefully the second goal of giving us some vocabulary is it will be an aid to the first. And that having some terms and some basic understandings will help us pay better attention to the beautiful in our experience. And there are many ways that beauty can help us think about what people are for. I want to suggest that one of the most important insights that beauty can offer in this discussion about what people are for is beauty's focus on form. Beauty is centrally concerned with form, that is with the particular and arrangement and disposition of the parts of a thing. And this vision of form is important for understanding of what people are for. Because, as I'll try to demonstrate at the end of the paper, the ability to see the form of our lives, the particular mold, the particular limits into which we've been forged, that our lives are constructed by, can help us know not only what we are for, what people are for, but also teach us how we can begin to grow into our vocations, into that which we've been called for. So, the core of these reflections comes from Hans Urs von Balthasar's The Glory of the Lord is Theological Studies. It's a massive seven volume work. He's a Swiss theologian. Um, he wrote this in 1954 or 60, over a few years. Um, so, especially the second half of the paper, I'm drawing largely. Okay, so beauty. Beauty. Whatever our jumbled understandings of beauty might be, we all agree that it's important, right? No one is going to say, nah, beauty doesn't matter, right? If you sit there, you think, oh yeah, beauty's important. Of course, I think so. Yeah, but um, when we turn to the world of our experience, to our experience of the beautiful in the day to day, it becomes a little bit more problematic trying to account for what beauty is, and problematic for a couple different reasons. So look out some basic problems we might have as we think about our experience of beauty. So think about, as I, as I talk about this, think about your experience of beauty. If someone wants to talk to you about beauty in your day to day life, uh, think if you fall under one of these three categories. First, this is the most common one, Beauty seems to us purely subjective. What you think is beautiful is what you think is beautiful. And I have my own experience of beauty, and that's that. Uh, you think it's beautiful, I don't? OK. How are we going to have a discussion or a debate? It's, it's radically subjective. Um, and that doesn't lend itself well to debate or group reflection. What's the point in talking about it if merely it is whatever you experience it to be or whatever I experience it? That's the, that's the, the common cultural critique of beauty, I think. It's just in the eye of the beholder. Right? Um, but this, though we hear it often, is a little too easy. While it certain, beauty certainly has an interior and subjective aspect, the boundaries and borderlines are not as nebulous as we like to think. We actually pay attention to what reality is like. Stratford Caldecott points out uh, that for all our promotion of, the, of relativity, of values, it ignores the basic facts of what is in our experience, which is this, quote, who will not admit that harmony is more beautiful than dissonance? Or that health is more beautiful than sickness? Or that kindness is more beautiful than cruelty? Very few people will admit that. And most of those people, we have labels for them. 
um, psychopath and other kinds of people, right? Who prefer cruelty to kindness. We say that other, that, that's, those people, there's something disordered about them. Caldecott goes on to recount the experiment of an architect and an artist, Christopher Alexander, who uh, had this simulation where he'd take a group of people and he'd pair any two random objects, this podium and that piano, any two things, right? Um, and then to help them think about their perception of beauty, he would ask them a battery of questions about those two objects, these six questions. Which of these two objects is more attractive? Which do you like best and why do you like it? Which gives you the most wholesome feeling? Which better represents your whole self? Which give which, if you had a choice, which would you spend eternity with? And which of them, <laughs> and which of them would you be happier to <laughs> offer to God? Those six questions, he asked them. And what he found was, as he asked people these questions, it got them to respond, that while answers to questions one through three vary, people would choose one of the objects, there was no, there was no pattern. Which do you like best, which is most attractive, which makes you feel the best? Now nah, that was that, that just varied individual to individual. But the last three questions, which better represents your whole self? Which would you rather spend eternity with? Which would you be happier to offer to God? Ninety percent of people chose the same object in answering those questions. There was a startling consistency when people sat down and really thought about it, uh, about answering deeper questions about those objects. There's some there's some basic criteria that we all have in common. It's not, beauty is not so radically subjective as we often assume. It's not merely a matter of my interior experience and your interior experience. Though that figures into it, that is part of it. Uh, it. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but our eyes are often more similar than we think. There's complaint number one, hopefully partially. Complaint number two, particularly as Christians, we think beauty is wasteful. What's the point? We I spend all these mo all the money on the cathedrals and the symphonies and the statues. Couldn't all that money be spent better spreading the gospel and feeding the poor and saving starving people all over the world? I mean, how do you justify sitting and listening to a symphony or commissioning a work of art for thousands and, or hundreds of thousands of dollars? In his acceptance speech uh, for the 2014 American Academy of Religion Award in Religion and the Arts, artist Makoto Fujimura makes this response to that critique. He points to Mary of Bethany, who comes, as you remember, and pours the expensive perfume over Jesus' feet. From a purely practical level, Fujimura notes, this is totally wasteful. This is pointless. That's really expensive perfume poured out. <laughs> A fleeting moment of sensory pleasure. That's it. Then it's gone. And in the aroma-filled room, the disciples don't lose any time in pointing this out. This is exactly their complaint. Come on. Why'd you do that? Couldn't all that money have been used better on important things? They grumble, so he says. Um, and Fujima responds to their complaint by this, by observing that Mary's act is wasteful. It is an unnecessary luxury. And so is art. It's wasteful, it's gratuitous, it's unnecessary, it's luxurious. But, he says, if we come to it, so then are our very lives. Art is gratuitous, art is extravagant, but so is God, he says. God does not need us, yet he created us out of his gratuitous love. We are a luxury, we are an extravagance. Beauty helps us recognize that. So attention to beauty thus becomes a way of rightly responding to the miracle and mystery of existence which is wasteful and gratuitous. The extravagance of beauty reminds us of the extravagance of ourselves. And Jesus praises Mary for her actions. He says, she has done a beautiful thing for me. An act so praiseworthy, he says, that wherever the gospel is proclaimed, her story will be told. There's a lot more that we could say about that, about the place of beauty in Christianity, and our suspicion of that. Um, that's another point. <clears throat> But, hopefully that gives you at least one image of how beauty might be worthwhile, even if it is luxurious, even if it is extravagant. And finally, and perhaps most problematically, this critique of the extravagance of beauty can be deepened and applied to beauty itself. Isn't beauty a bit scandalous? I mean, really, think about it. Isn't, isn't beauty a bit scandalous? <clears throat> Terrible people can be beautiful. Terrible people 
can do can produce great beautiful works. It appears that beauty is often separated from the true and the good, that it has nothing to do with ethics or morality or truth. Thus, David Bentley Hart notes in The Beauty of the Infinite that, quote, there is an unsettling prodigality about the beauty, beautiful, something wanton about the way it lavishes itself upon even the most atrocious of settings, its anodyne sweetness often seeming to make the most intolerable circumstances barren. Cambodian killing fields were often lushly flowered, and Nazi commandants often fell asleep to strains of Bach performed by ensembles of Jewish dance. How can you praise beauty in that sense? How can we think beauty is important? Doesn't beauty cover up the violence of existence? Doesn't it tell us, oh, don't worry about all that stuff? Just be happy. Just listen to the symphony. And yet, we find that despite this apparently, and I'll say apparently because I don't want to argue that it is, apparently not ethical quality, which can distract us, by which the beauty, beautiful can distract us from tragedy and terror. We find that actually those in the midst of the killing fields and the concentration camps are some of the most fervent advocates of beauty, the people who praise beauty the most. Uh, thus, from, from the vast fields of Russia and the suffering of Russia, Dostoevsky in his novel Yidia proclaims through the mouth of Prince Mishkin, Beauty will save the world. It is a startling, a striking point. And a century later, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, another Russian, who saw the best of what the 20th century had to offer in a way of horror and terror and awful things, and awful things in his time in the gulags, takes up this cry in his Nobel acceptance speech and says, reiterates Dostoevsky's words, beauty will save the world. Now, how is that true in any sense of the term? How in a nuclear age, in the world of terror and ISIS and the world market, can beauty save anybody, much less the world? How is that possible? Hopefully we'll have some answers to that by the end of this talk. Solzhenitsyn answers his own question, because he poses that. When did beauty stop the tanks? It didn't. It won't. Uh, he answers that with reference to the old formula of the three transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty. And he says that perhaps that ancient trinity of truth, goodness, and beauty is not an old, empty formula. Quote, if the two blatant, two direct stems of truth and goodness are crushed and cut down, if in the modern world we, we refuse to talk about truth and goodness, if they're oppressed, then perhaps, perhaps, he says, the fantastic, unpredictable, unexpected stems of beauty will push through and soar to that very same place, and in doing so will fulfill the work of all. Perhaps beauty can bring truth and goodness along with it. We hope so. Von Balthasar, von Balthasar describes the opposite, the inverse. What happens to truth and goodness when they're divorced from the beauty, as he thinks they have been in our modern world. Without truth and beauty, or without beauty, truth and goodness lose their persuasive power. In a world which cannot see or reckon with beauty, von Balthasar argues, quote, the good also loses its attractiveness, the self-evidence of why it must be carried out. Without beauty, we don't, the good is not necessarily desirable. I'm not quite sure why we should do good and not evil. And in a world that has no longer confidence in itself to affirm the beautiful, the proofs of truth have lost their cogency. The logic of these answers is except itself a mechanism which no longer captivates Without beauty, truth, and goodness, they don't draw us in. They don't inspire us. They don't enthuse us. And it's in this vein that I get the blurb from the title. It's in this vein that von Balthasar declares that those who sneer at beauty, quote, cannot pray and soon will no longer be able to love. That's a dramatic claim. Perhaps it's a little bit too dramatic for us. Right? You sit there and you think, oh, come on. That's laying it on a bit thick, right? Okay, beauty's important. But I can pray. I can pray without beauty. What does beauty have to do with how I pray? And loving? Shh, I can love all kinds of people. I don't need that. What, what, how is beauty important for them? Answering that question requires some definitions. So we'll establish a basic foundation for understanding beauty, and then we'll return to this question of the importance of beauty and its place in our lives, and how it might help us understand who we are and what we're doing a little bit better. OK. Precise definition of beauty is notoriously difficult. It's really hard to define the beautiful. Yet, von Balthasar offers a basic vocabulary. 
So here's our basic vocabulary we're going to lay out. Right? The figure of what is seen, the object itself, the beautiful thing itself, whether that's a statue or a mountain or a, a, a picture, whatever it is, provides the first grounds for beauty. Quote, those words which attempt to convey the beautiful gravitate, first of all, toward the mystery of form or a figure, the shape of the thing. And the Latin, the Latin helps us see this connection, Von Balthasar says. Formosus, beautiful in Latin, comes from forma, which is shape. And speciosus, comely, comes from species, likeness. So form, first part of beauty, form. The form, the shape of the thing. What is the figure of it? But form alone, however, doesn't account for the whole presence of the beautiful. Indeed, Von Balthasar says, to ask the question of form is to raise the great question of the radiance from within, which transforms species into speciosa, likeness into wonder, the question of splendor. Here's our other main definition, our main term. The relationship between form and radiance gives rise to Thomas Aquinas' definition of beauty as the splendor formi, the splendor of form, the radiance of form. So keep to those two terms in your mind as we go. Form, the shape, the outline, the parts of the thing, radiance. That with shines through the figure, making it love-worthy, making, making us stop and say, wow, let me see it. Another way of thinking about this combination is through the traditional trinity of adjectives used to describe the beautiful. In integrity, harmony, and clarity. The beautiful possesses integrity. It's one discrete object. It's one thing and no other. It possesses harmony, or right proportion. All its constituent parts work together in pleasing combinations. And those first two, integrity and harmony, you might group under form, the arrangement and disposition of the particulars of any given thing. That's form. But the beautiful also possesses claritas, which we translate from the Latin as clarity, but also means radiance. Uh, it's translucent, pointing beyond itself to something greater. That's splendor. Splendor and form. Now, thinking about beauty in this way, as the splendor form, has a long history in Christian thought. In his seminal study, Art and Beauty in the Middle Ages, Umberto Eco notes that this subject of the beauty of being, the splendor form, was a common topic for medieval thinkers. He traces both the classical elements of this theme inherited from the Neoplatonists and the Christian transmutation of those elements to consider the beauty of God's actions in creation and redemption. The central text for this reflection in the Christian tradition is Dionysus' On the Divine Name. For Dionysus, it's the flashing forth of divine beauty which both creates and illumines the cosmos. So I'm going to read you a paragraph from Dionysus. Uh, and it's thick stuff, so hang with it as best you can. But the superessential beautiful is called beauty because, the nature of beauty, the quality of beauty, of that quality which it imparts to all things severally according to their nature, according to their particular form, because it is the cause of harmony and splendor in all things, flashing forth upon them all like light, the beautifying communications of its originating ray. And, it be, and because it summons, beauty summons all things to fare unto itself, and because it draws all things together in a state of mutual interpenetration. So here we find already, in Dionysus, who's relatively early, an understanding of beauty is both the splendor, the flashing forth, as well as form quality given to each thing according to the kind of thing it is. And in his response to Dionysus' reflection on divine beauty, Thomas observes that, quote, beauty is the cause of harmony and splendor in all things because, here's the key, beauty is the participation of the first cause which makes all things, beautiful things beautiful. For the beauty of the creature is nothing other than the similitude of the divine beauty participated in things. So all forms, Everything that's beautiful derives its beauty from its participation in divine beauty, from its participation in God, in the life of the Trinity. To speak a little bit more plainly, that's heady theological stuff, we might say that all beauty is simply a reflection of the beauty of God. Every beautiful thing we encounter, think, think of something beautiful you've seen in the past week. A tree, a sunset, a painting, a person, all of that participates in divine beauty. Dante's, Dante's Paradise provides a lot of examples of this. The language of reflection is built into the very fabric of Paradise as Beatrice's beauty, who's his guide through Paradise. It's her beauty 
that is the mirror or lens through which Dante begins to approach the Godhead and to be able to see the divine. Beatrice tells Dante, quote, any good that lies outside God is nothing but a ray reflected from his radiance. All the beautiful things that we see are but reflected rays of the original primary divine beauty. Now, this relationship between all the beautiful things of our experience and divine beauty means that one of beauty's primary characteristics, and this is true, people who think about the beautiful uh, note this over and over, one of beauty's primary characteristics is that it's an invitation. Beauty comes from outside ourselves. It's not merely a product of our own perception. We experience it internally, but it's not produced by us. Thus, beauty always possesses the first word in the conversation. She speaks and we respond. In Dionysus' terms, she summons us to fare towards herself. David Bentley Hart describes it in this way, quote, there is an overwhelming givenness in the beautiful, and it is discovered in astonishment, in an awareness of something fortuitous, adventitious, essentially indescribable. It is known only in the moment of response from the position of one already addressed and able now only to reply. Okay. So I want to take an example of that fact and help us come back down from this abstract realm of theory to something particular and practical and embodied. Uh, so, this, this picture. This is uh, Piero della Francesca's painting, fresco painting titled The Resurrection. And I have a poem by Wendell Berry that's an apraxic meditation on this, on this painting. So, pass these back, and we'll talk about the poem on this one. There may not, there are more of you here than I thought were going to be. So there may not, you may have to share as we get toward the back. That's okay. We'll read the poem out together. What was it going back? What do you notice about this painting? Just looking at it. I mean, you probably can't see it very well in the back, but what strikes you about it? Yeah. Jesus is Jack. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and what is this? What is not only that? How does his posture emphasize that? Yeah, he's, man, he's standing on top of the tomb, right? He has conquered death. He is, he is victorious. Good. What else? What else do you notice about this? He's confident. Yeah. He's. He's conquered and he knows it, right? But he's not celebrating, right? He's not jumping up and down. Uh, he's pretty calm. There's kind of sereneness here. Yeah. What else do you notice? Yeah. Sorry, okay. Okay. Yeah. What was the bed? Good. There is a big contrast between uh, him and like the background and the rest of the people. Okay. What's the contrast? Like they're all like sleeping and like not paying attention, just kind of just standing in the background. Yeah, good. Yeah, the background is, is dead in the one half of the poem. You can't, the colors don't come through very well here. Um, but on the left side of the picture, all the trees are barren. The right side of the picture, however, there's foliage and things are green. It looks like springtime. Um, that. And then we've got these figures. Two of them are asleep, uh, but the other two seem to be responding. They've seen, right? Here's our first point. This, this, this helps demonstrate. Christ is the actor here. He's the one clearly conquering. He's the one coming out of the tomb. Uh, and it's, it's the figures in the portrait who are responding to him. Two of them are asleep. They haven't seen him. But the other two, the one of them is reeling backward. The other guy's got his face buried in his hands, uh, hiding himself almost from the encounter with the divine. Uh, the glory of the risen Christ is too much. He can't take it. But the painting also addresses us as viewers. Because you can't see it very well. But Christ's eyes are looking out at you and at me. It's hard to see from the back. Um, they're not looking at the people in front of them. They're looking out. And so, uh, he's, the eyes see you and I here. And to drop this point, I'd like to look at this poem um, by Barry that helps get at this, I think. Uh, and any insights I have here about this poem are just thanks to Jeff Bilbrow, um, who pointed out to me. So this is, this, is, this is just me channeling him. Um, so, let me read this poem. 
And we'll talk about, as I read it, think about what features of the painting does the poem emphasize? How in reading the poem does it bring out or make you pay attention to things in the painting? The Resurrection. Early in the year, by my friend's gift, I saw at San Sepulcro, the place where this is painted, Piero's vision, the soldiers who guard the dead from the living, themselves become as dead men, one tumbling dazedly backward. Awake, his wounds bleeding still, his foot on the tomb, Christ, who bore our life to its most wretched end, having thrust off like a blanket the heavy lid, stands. But for his face and countenance, I have found no words. Powerful beyond life and death, seen beyond sight or light, beyond all triumph serene. All this Piero saw. And we who were sleeping, seeking the dead among the dead, dare to be awake. We who see, see we are forever seen. By sight have been forever changed. The morning at last has come, the trees once bare are green. <coughs> as you read that poem, as a meditation on the painting, what does it draw your attention to? What does it point out to you about the painting that you hadn't noticed? Jesus is still bleeding. Okay, yeah, he's still bleeding. The risen Christ still has his wounds, his hands and his feet. Those don't go away. He doesn't lose his human form somehow in the way it's been marked and marred in the resurrection. That's still present, which is a point we may get to later in the talk. Um, good? What else? Yeah. But when he says, by sight have been forever changed, it seems like he's talking on two levels, maybe about our sight of the painting, but also about Christ seeing us. Good. Yeah, exactly. The reference there is unclear. By sight have been forever changed. We who see, see that we are forever seen. That's by Christ. All we see. We are forever seen by the eyes of Christ in this painting. By sight have been forever changed. But is that our sight or Christ's sight? By Christ's sight have been forever changed. That makes sense. By our sight of this have been forever changed. That makes sense too. Both. Yeah. It's ambiguous. We are seen. The beautiful is an address. It comes to us and it says something to us. It makes a claim, an invitation. And we respond. Or don't. But we are seen by the eyes of Christ here. Note too that... Barry helps us point to the fact that we have this progression, even in creation. This is a restoration, not of, only of us, but of creation. We move from the barren trees on the left to foliage in the spring on the right. Uh, it's come to restore not only us, but the world. Okay. Beauty is an invitation to participation. Pic this picture invites you to participate. The eyes of Christ are an invitation. It calls to us and asks us to join in the harmonies and narratives of creation and redemption. St. Bonaventure beautifully describes this uh, in St. Francis' Encounter with Beauty. In describing St. Francis' Encounter with Beauty, St. Bonaventure talks about these terms of participation and engagement. Quote, in the things of beauty, particular things of the world, the animals he loved, the forests, the places, the people he loved. In the things of beauty, Francis contemplated the one who is supremely beautiful. And led by the footprints he found in creatures, he followed the beloved everywhere. Beauty is an invitation, an address, asks us to come participate. Okay. Now, having established this basic and admittedly very, very hasty account of beauty, I want to turn to von Balthasar's theological aesthetics. It is an attempt to give an account of beauty from the grounds of theology. This is a little bit dense, so stay with me as best you can, and we'll come back at the end to what this means for us, how it might have some payoff for us day to day, and how we live the rest of today, and tomorrow, and this week, and this year, and the rest of our lives. So, hang on. Now, not surprisingly, uh, his account of 
beauty with, from a theological perspective centers on the person of Christ. So keep this image in mind, perhaps. Keep looking at it as we talk. As we talk. Um, think about how it, that helps you understand what he's talking about. Now, despite uh, the importance of form, of harmony and integrity and clarity, despite the importance of that uh, for perceiving being, von Balzer argues that this question, the question of form, has been insufficiently attended to in theology since the Reformation, uh, in both Catholic and Protestant theology. He critiques modern theological aesthetics for either reducing discussion of form, particularly Christ's form, to merely human standards, or advocating a total disjunction between the form of Christ and the world such that there's no proportion between them. So he says there's either two moves that people have made, basically, since the Reformation. Either Christ's form is, is merely the best according to a human standard of beauty. Uh, there's, he's, just, he's the highest on this kind of progression of beauty. He's just the top, right? Or he's so radically different. The beauty of Christ, I understand, is so radically different from the beautiful of our experience that there's no proportion between it. There's no analogy. You can't look at what you know about beauty and your experience of it and know anything about Christ. Those two are totally separate. Von Balthasar sets out to discover a theological aesthetics which can harmonize these two competing movements. He wants to develop a theory, a theory of form and beauty which grounds itself in revelation, the coming from outside our experience, right? and yet can still engage and encounter our experience of the beautiful, what we know the beautiful to be from our daily lives. To do this, he follows St. Thomas and begins the definition of form, which is necessarily both a real presence of depth, form has depth, and a pointing beyond itself to these depths. Beautiful is there, it has some content, and it points beyond itself. Form presents being, and that being, and that presentation leads us deeper into the infinity of being. Yet, with regard to theology, form is peculiar in that the new light which Christ brings illuminates the form and breaks forth from within the form itself. For this reason, he argues, Christ's radiance cannot be simply greater in a, common, in, a, in a quantitative sense than our sense of the beautiful. It's not as if the Parthenon is beautiful and Christ is more beautiful on a nice little sliding scale. Beautiful, more beautiful, most beautiful Christ. No. The eruption of Christ's glory into human existence is something radically new. Uh, and it brings the light by which we can see what this new thing is. However, we are not addressed in total mystery. We are still able to see Christ. His radiance sustains comparison and analogy. We still know something. Although our intuitive sense of the beautiful doesn't match perfectly onto Christ, he's just the most beautiful thing we could imagine, that they're not totally separate or cut off. It's only through God's revelation of himself in history that we can begin to approach and know his beauty. And yet we must never simply equate his appearance with his beauty. We begin to know the beauty of God, the beauty of the divine, through the person of Christ. Yet we never simply equate those or attempt to abandon his appearing and move solely to himself. To say, once we, once we know, once we understand, if it's ever possible, the beauty of the incarnate person Christ, we can go beyond that. He's just a bridge. He's a ladder that we can, once we get to the beauty of the Godhead, we can do away with that. No. We must, we, our, our journey to God must employ a negative theology always based on the positive theology of knowing God visibly. For von Balthasar, then, the revelation of Christ's form provides the key for any theological aesthetics. If the luminosity of form, it's translucent, it's, it's ability to emit something beyond ourselves, to point us beyond, um, then the form of the incarnation as the presence and presentation of God himself is definitive and determinative for all forms. The form of Christ, the particular arrangement of his parts and the ordering of his life, is definitive for our total understanding of beauty. The visible form of Christ is the locus of all theology, says von Balthasar the central evidence from which shines the glory of God. Now, given how unique that is, worldly measures of beauty and form cannot be applied. You can't simply say, we know X about the beautiful, and so Christ just must be the most beautiful thing we can imagine. The cross frustrates that. You try to set up a system of beauty on your own, it doesn't include the cross. How is that beautiful? How can that, in any sense, be described uh, as partaking in any kind of But von Balthasar claims that Christianity is the aesthetic religion par excellence. It's the best 
we can do. The, the Christianity offers resources for aesthetics and beauty better than any other religion. And he locates that in the person of Christ in the incarnation, passion, resurrection that determines the beautiful. The beauty of Christ determines all speech about the beauty of God as well as the beauty of the world. That's a larger point. We don't need to go into that. But uh, this is what he wants to establish at the start of his big, long theological aesthetics. The two directions which theological aesthetics have pursued since the Middle Ages, focusing on divine beauty to the exclusion of all worldly beauty, or the subsuming of the beauty of Christ within natural measures of beauty, both fail to take seriously the form of Christ in all its particularity. Francesca Murphy sums up with admirable succinctness von Balthasar's basic contention. Quote, this is her summary. The crucified Christ is the expression of transcendental beauty. The beautiful is to be perceived. The historical form of Christ makes it perceptible. Von Balthasar argues that all questions of form are uniquely decided in Christ. What perfection, quote, what perfection and infinity really are for man, what emancipation and emanation and encapsulation, self-surrender and being caught up really are, what transfiguration, deification, immortality, what all those really are, what all the great words of aesthetics, all these words we used to describe are the beautiful. It transports us, it moves us. It's in the Christ form that all of it has its measure and true context. Now, as I'm sure you're beginning to notice, von Balthasar thinks that form is really, really important. Here's why. For von Balthasar, it is form which provides the means of God's revelation to man, the particular arrangement of actual stuff, material things. Between the infinite and the finite, there is no proportion. You can't have some kind of proportional relationship. And so, von Balthasar says, in all non-Christian mysticism, an encounter with the divine, the infinite and the identical destroy finitude and particular. When you finally get to the divine, your identity is erased. How are you, how, how, the, the, the many cannot participate in the one. In Christianity, however, he says, the appearance of God occurs within the form, not his form as he is in himself, but as a concealed epiphany of the thing itself and the medium of the relationship between God and creature. And it's this presence in form in the incarnation that underlies Hart's claim that Christian thought uniquely must think the beautiful and the infinite together. The incarnation makes the particular, the definite, the concrete, the stuff, we're surrounded by the ground for moving into the infinite. Thus, for von Balthasar, form is the crux of God's interaction with us. In the intelligibility of form lies the possibility of our journey into God, a journey in which we must, must both plunge into the depths of being which form reveals, while also holding on to the form as our certain guide. Lest all this talk of form and beauty in Christ seem too rarefied and divorced from our everyday lives, as it probably was, I want to return, I want to close by returning to the question of the human person, which focuses concern with this issue. And think about how form, talk about form, might help us understand that. To be Christian is to take on a particular form, particular outline and arrangement and disposition of our parts, in both a general and a specific sense. In a general sense, we're all called to be conformed to the image of Christ. We use this language all the time. Think of St. Paul. In our baptism, we have put on Christ. Some translations say we have clothed ourselves in Christ, taken on the form. Thus, von Balthasar argues that to be Christian is precisely a form that is a definite and particular habit of life into which we must grow. An arrangement and ordering of the parts of our life in accordance with the form of redemption which Christ offers. He means that the form is helpful to us. I'll give an example in a second. But if we hold on to the form we've been given, we'll begin to grow into it. He provides marriage as an example of this. As an example of how form itself can shape and mold us. Quote, this is von Balthasar, marriage is that indissoluble reality which confronts with an iron hand all existence's tendencies to disintegrate. And it compels, marriage, compels the faltering person to grow beyond himself into real love by modeling his life on the form enjoined. But it's not the love of the spouses that enables growth here in this account, but faithfulness to the form of marriage itself. Quote, when they make their promises, when they're married, the spouses are not relying on themselves, the shifting songs of their own freedom, but rather on the form to which they've committed themselves in their acts as persons. You get married, you're relying on marriage itself, the form, to help you out. 
not on the emotional state of your spouse, whatever that may be, over the course of 40 or 60 or 80 years. It's the form of marriage itself which bonds the spouses more deeply than their emotional states ever could. This is an example of why form is so important for Christians. That's one form. There are many. Um, the one he gives is an example. And it's in this sense that to be Christian at all is to take on a particular form of life. That's the general sense of why form is important, but particularly for you, in an even more particular sense, in a personal sense, we're all called to take on that particular form of life which is unique to us. We're all called uniquely. Our call to holiness is specific. The form we must inhabit is irreducibly particular. The British novelist Evelyn Waugh gives voice to this point very well. In a letter to John Benjamin about his novel, Helena, a novel which follows the mother of Constantine, Helena, and her discovery of the true cross. And in response to the complaint that Helena's life doesn't look like a saint's life, she's not pious, she's not devout, she's not always a good person, uh, she doesn't really care for most of her life about God or theology or faith or anything. In response to that complaint, her, her life doesn't look like what we'd imagine a saint's life to look like. Law says this. He says, the call to holiness is unique to every person. He says, I cannot be St. Francis or St. Thomas. I can only ever be St. Evil and Law. You can only ever be yourself, perfected. What do you say? And then because he was a grouchy old man, and he knew it, he adds, I can only ever be St. Evelyn Law after God knows what experiences in purgatory. Because <laughs> he, knew, he, he knew he was not a nice person. <laughs> We must become ourselves, our true selves, and we can only do this by attending to the forms into which we've been called. Beauty can help us with this task. In his 2009 meeting with artists, Benedict XVI claims that beauty can lead us to ourselves. Quote, the experience of beauty does not remove us from reality. It's not escapist. On the contrary, it leads to a direct encounter with the daily reality of our lives, liberating it from darkness, transfiguring it, making it radiant and beautiful. Engagement with the beautiful can illuminate our day-to-day -day actions, the forms which, we've been, which we have chosen and by which we've been chosen. But beauty also leads us beyond ourselves, as Benedict points out. Quote, authentic beauty, however, unlocks the yearning of the human heart, the profound desire to know, to love, to go towards the other, to reach for the beyond. Beauty can help us see both the form of our lives and the splendor that illuminates that form, the wonderful mystery in which we're immersed every day and to which we are summoned and called. Near the close of his meeting with artists, Benedict speaks of a, quote, via pulchritudinous, a path of beauty, which is at the same time an artistic and an aesthetic journey, a journey of faith, of theological inquiry. This path, the path of beauty, can help us it can teach us how to read rightly the forms of our lives. It can help us to follow Christ, to be ever more attentive to the invitation of the beautiful, to pay attention to the particular, to the form, in order that we might begin to participate in that external splendor of which the visible things of beauty are but the first glimpse. Thank you. There's a little bit of time for questions. If you have questions, if there are particular things you want to ask. And if you want to talk after, I'd be happy to talk about any of this. Brent, so um, I, you, one of your initial questions was, was who would choose kindness over, or you were quoting, but who is choosing cruelty over yeah, kindness? Yeah, yeah. And one of them was who is choosing Dissonance yeah. over harmony, I think, was the, yeah. the opposite. Um, I mean, I don't want to make postmodernism be the bad guy here because it's not, but dissonance as an art form flourishes in the postmodern, whether that be conceptual dissonance with irony and things like that, yeah. or with, I mean, listen to the, the music you all listen to. There might be dissonance in the music, and you still find it <clears throat> appealing in some kind of way. So, you know, given a sort of postmodern aesthetic, is, is our current uh, climate more in opposition with classical beauty than it's ever been, or is it just adapted into a new mm. form where dissonance or irony takes on a right. beautiful side? Yeah, uh, good question. I think, I think the answer is probably both, in that it certainly can be 
the, the ironic, the form of irony, for instance, uh, is an art form. And there, there are ways of doing that beautifully. So dissonance isn't necessarily and inherently unbeautiful. But um, when pursued to the exclusion of everything else, or at the suspicion that we like dissonance not because it's done well in this instance, but because we're suspicious that harmony is really sneaky, that, that harmony promises things that it can't deliver on, that dissonance is really more true to reality. The disjointed and fractured and fragmented statements are much more true to what is than any kind of conjoining harmonious ordering. I think that's that's probably when it when it becomes uh, distrustful, or, or that's when it becomes antithetical to the kind of beauty that von Bolt talked about. Um, and so he wants to say that yeah, we live in a, we live in a time where we don't we don't. We don't really pay attention to beauty. I mean, we can't get away from it. It's everywhere, but we're suspicious of it. Uh, and we think that it's, 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 it's dishonest. It's sneaky, because it moves us. Um, but we don't think it moves us rightly. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered. Well, I, I mean, I just, I don't want to take anyone else. I just think it's, you know, in the time when some of the most, uh, uh, I mean, I think of like commercials and the bombardment of narratives, and then you have this kind of dissonance as an answer to it. And just, I don't know, maybe just about you know the the kind of art that we've all grown up with versus the kind of art that Francesca would have grown up with. Yeah. Like, what do you see as affecting us? Not just having our aesthetic views, but maybe our theological views based on what we've grown up with in terms of consumerism, how that gets packaged into something beautiful and how maybe artists respond to that with dissonance and, and mm, other Yeah, yeah, well I think probably the, the first thing that comes to mind is that we're trained to regard the beautiful as pretty emotional, given all the advertising and the basic tenor of, of a lot of the music we listen to. It's all aimed at your emotions. It's all aimed at making you feel something and feel really excited about something. So that's probably our first thought about the beautiful is it's stuff that makes me feel really good uh, in an emotional way. Um, which is certainly part of it, but we tend to be suspicious of rational discussion, that there's an intellectual aspect to it, right? It, the beauty is simply what I enjoy. There's nothing more than that. It, um, I think probably growing up in the kind of consumerist uh, world that we have, where we're appealed to, by, by and large, by our basic emotions and desires, um, rather than any kind of rational discourse. That that's maybe our, that structures our basic approach into what we think beauty is and how it might be moving us or affecting us. Yeah. Um, I think it was your uh, complaint number two about particularistic Christians, which would include most evangelicals, that we're very functional in our thinking. Yeah. We don't appreciate beauty. It's all about how can it's all about using things as means. You think of one of the premier evangelical art forms, the left behind novels and movies, they're incredibly functional. They yeah, care very yeah. little about aesthetics, right? So do you see any hope for evangelicals to uh, uh, learn to appreciate beauty, or would it be better just to leave evangelicals? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I think that there is, a, there is a growing sense, and I think you can see it uh, in a number of forms. There's a growing sense that we need to attend to beauty more carefully. And I think that's true whether you're evangelical or mainline Protestant or Catholic or whatever. I think there's a growing sense that, um, and I think, I think we, we attend to it as, as our cultural discourse breaks down more and more. We find ourselves less and less able to have productive conversations across boundaries and across lines. Um, a sense that beauty somehow helps us do that. Beauty helps cross those distances. And as we sense the culture maybe growing more alien from us, I think people are starting to recognize and not be as suspicious and afraid of beauty as they have been, but recognize the resources that it offers um, for beginning to bridge some of those gaps that appear to be widening. All right, well, thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here. Uh, and I'll look forward to seeing you at other books today.